Get Outdoors Pedal and Paddle in Greensboro, North Carolina offers a wide range of products and services designed to help protect the environment and enhance the time people spend enjoying the outdoors. With an expansive year-round inventory of kayaks, sups, bikes, kayak fishing accessories, paddling clothing, biking accessories, and more, Get Outdoors has established itself as one of the top paddle sports and biking shops in the southeast. They also offer a wide range of kayak safety and technique courses to get you comfortable in your new boat. They'll even get it rigged up for you. Stop by the shop in Greensboro, North Carolina, or check them out at shopgetoutdoors.com. All right, this time on the podcast, I've got someone I'm really excited to introduce. I've got the Associate Dean at Fayetteville State University. He is professor of mathematics education. Uh, he's the pastor at Safe House Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, he's a researcher uh, focusing on equity and intersectionality. He's a husband. He's a father. He is a kayak fisherman, Mr. Peter Ely. And I just realized now um, that I did not ask to make sure I was pronouncing that name right. So he is going to let me know whenever he gets in here. And I guess I should say uh, that it's Dr. Peter Ely, correct? Uh, you're correct, and you said it correctly. So, um, bravo and um, and big ups to you, as they would say. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, go ahead, introduce yourself to our listeners. Tell us who Peter Ely is. Um, man, Peter Ely is just blessed and 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 doing his best to be a servant to um all he meets. Um, I'm just a lover of people. I'm very passionate about everything I do. Um, I have one switch. That's all the way on. So if I'm with you, I'm with you. If I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> and um, as I tell people, I, you know, I, I get high off life, man. I just get high. I get uh, my joy out of being able to help people and being able to help people reach their full potential and reach their level. And and just loving, you know, Christ and, and helping others um, to get there and enjoying the trip. Um, you know, I'm saved. I ain't born. <laughs> is what I tell people, you know. Um, you know, some believe, you know, because you, you know, you choose um, to walk the righteous path that this is a boring life, and, you know, and I, and I tell my church all the time, I spend all my time to focus on all the things he told me I could do. And there's so many things that he told me I could do. I don't have time to worry about the handful. He told me I could. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, man. So you have, you have quite a list of, of things that, that you do. Um, so I, I want to, I want to dive in um, to uh, your roles um, in, in, all, all of the things that you have going on, but uh, let's start with uh, your roles at Fayetteville State University. So, um, so let's let's start with Associate Dean. Um, so, I did not know. Um, uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and give everybody some background on me. I have a uh, I have an associate's degree from a community college. And I was never involved in any of the behind the scenes stuff or the leadership of the college or anything like that. All of that was was completely foreign to me. So um, so I'll let you explain it to uh, to my listeners in case anybody is as ignorant on that subject as I am. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, so believe it or not, I, I was just like you. I was very ignorant to a lot of these things. A lot of these things I actually got exposed to in college. Um, I was fortunate. I'm one of those ones. Obviously, I'm an outgoing person. I'm a people person. And while I was there in college, for some reason, I got this odd notion that I wanted to run for student government president. And um, I, I did it. I ran. And I actually was fortunate enough to win. And by winning, what they did, that was um, that was a pivotal point in my life in that um, those leaders there um, really poured into me to, um, to really invested in me as a student. To, um, they helped me be a student leader. So I got um, sent to a lot of different leadership camps all across this country. Uh, I remember we was at a basically almost like a wilderness camp in the middle of Champaign, Illinois. Um, I'd never been on an airplane before. Um, I'm a country boy. I grew up in Henderson, North Carolina, right off 85, home of Car Lake. Yeah, that's my home lake. So um, that that's what we, you know, I did. And, I, you know, put me on a plane, sent me to, out to Chicago in a big mansion in the middle of the woods. And taught me about myself and others, and and how to you know relate to one of um, others. So um, leaders can, you know, people often say leaders are born. No, I do believe that they can be trained. 
um, you know, some people may have the wiring already put in and others you have to put the wiring in, but they'll work just the same. So I like to think I'm one of those ones that, you know, I had some passion there, but the wiring was definitely put in. And um, as a part of that, I got to see the leadership part. So I got to hang out a lot with our college president, got to go to these, these meetings and all these kind of things with him. Never even thought about it, maybe potentially being a career or doing something like that. And I saw what he did and I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> so for me to do what he was doing, I had to um, no, do what he did. And um, so I'm not there. I'm not a college president or nothing um, you know, yet, if that's God's will for me. But um, I'm moving along that, you know, that trajectory. And um, and that's kind of how I got started in that. So I started you know, with him. I'm learning it behind, you know, behind the scenes. So what happened is some there are some people who go directly to school just to do that. And then there's others who get trained into it because um, I started out as a, a teacher, um, a teacher or a professor. So I actually started out as a middle school teacher. I taught middle school mathematics in my hometown um, and um, uh, a middle school there. And then I went on and I taught at the high school and uh, coached um, football there at the high school at um, South Granville High School in um, Creedmoor, North Carolina, right outside of Durham. And then I was fortunate enough, I left there and started working at St. Augustine's College there in Raleigh, North Carolina. Worked there at St. Aug, I think St. Augustine's University now, uh, but it was college when I was there. Um, fortunate enough to went on to Winston-Salem State. And I worked at Winston-Salem State for five years while I was working on my doctorate degree. And when I got to my doctorate degree, I was offered an amazing opportunity to go down to Fairville State. And I started there as an instructor and worked my way up um, from an instructor, um, from instructor to uh, assistant professor, then from assistant professor to a tenured associate, and from a tenured associate to now professor. Then I was a department chair, and now from a department chair to an associate dean. So um, as I tell people, I'm one of those ones that you know how some people have that that um, that story of you know they was a janitor, now they're the CEO. That's kind of my trajectory. I've done a little bit of everything. I've been on both sides of it. So that journey has been interesting, but I think it keeps me grounded. But I also know I can really relate to almost everybody on the campus because at some point I've, I've been where you've been or I've Absolutely. done some of the things you've done. So therefore, um, I understand that. So I do believe when my opportunity comes um, that I'll be able to be um, a lot stronger leader because I will be talking from a position of I know how it feels to be where you are versus um, I, I'm trying to figure out where you are. Absolutely. And so you've gone from uh, from middle school all the way up to college. Uh, so I'm curious to, to find out what's your, what's your favorite age to work with? Middle school, by far. They are, the middle school kids, are, they, they think they're grown, but they know they're quite not grown. So at that point, you still could kind of get through to them, right, and get some things. By the time you got elementary, they just too young. They too, you know, they really need. It. High school, they think they think they grown, so you can't really tell them them. That middle school is the soft spot. Um, you can do a lot of cool things with them. They still think you're kind of cool at that point. Um, before they, you know, they get to so that sixth, seventh, eighth grade, you still can kind of. By the time that ninth grade part kick in, and you know, <laughs> you know, it's 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 different. <laughs> Absolutely. I've, I've worked as a youth pastor before and, um, I've, I've, I've worked with, with youth, uh, for a long time and, and all different kinds of, um, kinds of roles and, and positions. And I always say that, that middle school is my favorite, um, favorite age to work with. And everybody always looks at me like I am crazy whenever I say that, but I, I'm glad to know that, that there's at least one other person out there who feels the same way I do. <laughs> But see, what that tells me about them is that they never spend any significant time around. That's what that tells me. Because you know, quickly, you got to put a pacifier in this one's mouth all the time. And this one, you got to put a GPS on to find out where they are. <laughs> they in the middle, they don't, they just do just enough and just enough. You know what I mean? You know, you ain't got to change them, but you got to know you got to, you got to take them somewhere to go. You ain't got to feed them, but you got to take them somewhere to, so they can feed themselves. You know, it's just enough of each one, you know they let you love on them a little bit, but then they push back, you know, so, okay, you know, they met that, you know, you met your quota for the day. And um, it was just a real, you know, fun time. Um, and it's really at that point that you really, you know, can impress a student. 
Um, um, because we even know from research wise that um, that how they start at ninth grade is going to determine what they're going to do pretty much in high school. And I can already show you what they do, you know, how they start at ninth grade can almost determine the trajectory for pretty much the rest of their life. It's not in stone, but on average, we can tell you that. That's that's very interesting. Um, I would love to kind of go back and look at my ninth grade year to see <laughs> see what it was that uh, that you, that we could learn from that. But absolutely, <laughs> so you are um, you are uh, in a teaching role at the college still, um, uh, professor of mathematics education. Um, so. Uh, so is that is that uh, course uh, or that um, series of courses or however it is, is that uh, kind of teaching somebody how to teach math? Um, is that um, how that would be? Yeah, absolutely. So the difference between math and math education, math mathematicians um, are working more on math theories and this kind of thing. And math educators, we're working more on the learning side. How do I teach somebody how to teach this? So I tell people all the time, there are a lot of brilliant people in the world. But it's a lot of it's not a lot of people who can tell you tell you what they know though. And we've all met those people like, man, this guy's just brilliant. But you ask him how you do that, he can't tell you. <laughs> so it's like, so I'm that person who could, I mean, I've been blessed to, you know, to know what they do, and I'm the translator and to be able to tell you, okay, this is what they really mean by this, and this is how you want to look at this. And um, for me, it's you know, it's part of my gifting to be able to um take complex things and be able to bring them down to um to layman's terms and you know i talk in a lot of analogies and this kind of thing it just kind of comes natural um to me um be honest i don't have to really work at it it's just one of those things for me that's awesome and so are you um are, have you always have you always been like a math person or was that something that that like you kind of fell into as you as you got older i would say yes and i'm gonna tell you why um uh, my mother my mother was my first math teacher. I remember my mom uh, back in the day. You know, I grew up in church. I'm a, I'm a church baby. You know, I was in the church. My grandfather was a um, bishop. So I don't know nothing but church. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I don't run away from that. Um, it's kept me from a lot of stuff. Okay. So I used, we used to get picked on and all this stuff. You know, y'all in church 24 7. So I look at my life now. And some of them look at theirs. And I'm grateful. Um, um, so why was I church all the time? You know, like Christmas, Christmas, Christmas things, 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 you know, all, you know, all this pre COVID, they used to get this Christmas. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to interrupt you just a second. You've got some sort of um, like distortion on your microphone. Um, it's, it's almost like an echo and a, a buzzing sound. Oh, it's, oh, it's my computer. computer. The pain, the pain, the pain, the pain. It's, it's picking up the things in my computer right it's um it's still it's, little, but it's um it sounds more like a distortion um really i got you on my yeti here let's see is that setting better it is it is okay change the setting on my microphone okay we're good yes we are good sorry about that <laughs> well, not a problem i want to make it right so what i'm about to tell you about uh, so, uh i had asked if you were if you were always a a math person and you were yeah so at christmas time our church they used to give these little bags away to all the kids at christmas and back then, all the candy wasn't individually wrapped. <laughs> so they used to put the candy together. And they used to all stick together. So you have like orange apples and you had this all hard candy. And um, as a kid, you know, we would want that candy. And my mom used to take it all and put it in this one bowl because I'm the oldest of five. And um, and for reward, we would get this candy. So she used to teach me math and, and I would get rewarded, you know, with the candy. And that's how um, I learned math. So my mom was my first math teacher. I was told that my grandfather was very good. In math, so maybe it's in the bloodline, and um, so I always kind of it came fairly easy to me, and kind of always you know just kept following that path. I mean, I took calculus in high school. Um, I ain't gonna say and tell you I did well in it. I mean, I did good enough to get out, <laughs> but um, I did take it in, in high school. Um, I've never made all A's. I've never got a 4.0. No time in college. I do have a lot of C's, 
it's plain to see on my transcript. So I want this to be inspiration to somebody else. You can be a C student too, as George Bush said, hey, and be president of the United States. And I'm telling you, you can be a C student too and get a PhD and do well. Um, in fact, what I found is the classes I got C's in are the ones I actually learned the stuff in. So uh, I want that to, you know, somebody who got a lot of C's out there, I want you to get A's, but uh, you getting a C is not the end of the work. I know some people make this thing like the person got a doctor, they got, you know, they super smart. No, it's people who just didn't quit. You know, that's what it is. So that's that question, I guess, in a nutshell. Um, I like to think I kind of have been, but I'm going to say I focused on it until about midway in college because I didn't even start out as a math major. I started out as a computer scientist. Okay. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I never um, I never liked math until I took a physics class. And um, uh, then it was just, it was math, but there was a reason I was doing it. Um, so I, I like math now. Um, I've never gone into any of the advanced stuff like calculus or anything like that. I've done trigonometry and, and algebra and those, those were great. I still, I hate geometry with a passion, but... <laughs> So, you know, geometry is all about proof. So if you want a great lawyer, man, get a math major. It's about logic and proof. You know, it's like you got this piece. It's like, think about geometry. It's like a big puzzle. And these are the definitions. And you just need to know how they all fit together. I got this piece. So if I got this piece, what's the next thing I can do? Oh, well, this piece relates to this piece. It's all about definition and how you put the definitions together. If this is equal to this, what else is equal to this? Oh, by definition, this equals that part. Okay, now you put these two together. So it's a, it has a logical order to it. So it's a, more of a, and the reason why geometry is important is because it teaches you how to think logically. That's awesome. Oh, you know, so everything is evidence, right? You got to have evidence to go to the next step. And that's what geometry teaches you. So a lot of people, what uh, one of the things I think I've seen to say, you know, about the internet is that especially you know all these different kind of platforms that people can just say whatever they want to say and don't have to prove anything, and um, and that's why people struggle with those kind of because people use this saying whatever they want to say and not having to have some support and evidence for them. Absolutely. Ooh. All right. <laughs> let's uh, <laughs> let's 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 uh, jump into your career as as a pastor. Um, so. Um, I, I don't even know where you find the time uh, to be able to do it. But uh, so uh, how long have you been have you been pastoring? So I've been pastoring here in Greensboro for um, five years. Um, I got ordained back in, was it 2000, I want to say about 2008. I got to go look. <laughs> 2008. But like I said, I've been in ministry you know, my entire life. But like I said, I didn't officially get ordained until like 2008. And then we stepped out on faith and started a um, church in 2018. So we have a small ministry here in Greensboro that we passed up, started really actually on social media. Um, when Facebook Live first came out, I would just started every morning was doing um, a little prayer and a podcast, much like we're doing now. And um, so that prayer and the podcast was like we're doing now. It would be recording it and doing the video at the same time and it just kept growing 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 and to the point that um we started meeting together as a church and then it led from there to where we are now as the safe house church in greensboro so um as you said how you find time you know we keep god first so you know early in the morning um you get up you know you do what you gotta do and and do those things so it's a natural progression like i said i grew up in the church so it wasn't that i had to i was fortunate enough since i grew up in the church this was always part of what I did versus the other way around. Some people like, oh, now I have to find time to do this or because now this is a new thing to me. No, it was already incorporated into what I did. So it was just if it wasn't there, it would be more like, OK, something's missing. That's awesome. And so um, I also definitely wanted to, to touch on on your research. Um, so um, one of the one of the things about you know math is is it it kind of lends itself to that researcher mentality um and so are you researching just as kind of a hobby or are you researching to uh hopefully get published or uh what what kind of research do you do 
So um, well, definitely no research is a hobby. Um, it's part of the job as a professor. So um, this is how you keep your job. And I am published. So feel free to Google my name, read some of my work. Um, I have several, you know, my dissertation is out there um, online. My master's this, um, thesis is out there online. Several um, articles and journal articles that are written out there online. I have many commentaries out there online. So I've been blessed to have been um, established as an um, expert in this area. You can go to my website, drpeterely.com, and you can see a list of other things and accomplishments um, that I have there. Uh, in 2000, um, 2020, I won the prestigious Board of Governors Awards for Excellence in Teaching um, through the UNC system. Um, they only pick um, 18, 16 people to get that award. I got that award. Um, gave me a big medallion, so I feel like I won the Olympics. Um, <laughs> I threw a thought about it, I would have brought it out. Um, you know, this big bronze medallion, and they gave me a check for $13,000, so that wasn't bad either. And that's actually <laughs> how I bought my kayak. That's how I got in the kayak fishing. Nice segue, right? <laughs> 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 Literally, I got in, I bought my first kayak with some of that money. That is I was like, Why can I reward myself? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy a kayak. But we'll get to that story how I got into kayaking. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I, before we jump into that, I definitely want to kind of kind of talk about what it is that you're researching. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go go for it. Go for yeah, it. So I, I research um, equity. I know equity is a buzzword now, but I was doing this before it became very popular. Um, I do equity in tracking, though. Um, so um, most of you, if you remember when you was in high school, you know, you start out in math, you would take, um, say, algebra one, then you go from algebra one to geometry, geometry, algebra two, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you get into those classes? They have policies and rules why you can get into those classes. We know, as I stated on earlier, if you don't get in certain classes, I know you're not going to probably be an engineer. I know you're probably not going to do something in STEM. And we always have this argument about getting more people in STEM, regardless of the color. We need more people in STEM. And so what we're able to go back and trace is that that starts with some of the rules and how people get into these courses. So I was able able to um, look at tracking to see how people get into the courses they get into. And, and, and certain groups of people were not being allowed into those courses. Um, in some areas is based on race. Some areas is based on classism. Some areas is based on um, whose parents are the most vocal. And because um, state, I mean, because education is not a federal issue, it's a state's issue. Most people think the federal government controls education. They don't. Your state, le your state legislator does, and your local school boards really do. That's where the power is. It's not in the president's office. They, he has really, really little power on that. The Secretary of Education did not have a lot of power over education. Hear me, hear me well. Those people in your local community are the ones who are making your education. So if your education is not what you want to be, them the ones you need to talk to because they have the power because the states are allowed to do whatever it is that they want to do for their state. And we only united under the umbrella of the federal government in the sense that they make recommendations. Now, how they make their recommendations is they make it with green. If you do what we ask you to do, we'll give you this money. So that's why you see the fight, especially in North Carolina. Oh, we're not taking this money. That was what that was about. Because if they take the money, then you have to take the recommendations. So they entice you when you know you need money. It's like, okay, how do we fill this windfall, this financial windfall um, gap we got? Well, we can get the government's money and we just got to do this part. Okay. And then that's when it starts, you know, playing that devil's advocate piece. Okay. How much of this we can do? Or what's the bare minimum of this we can do and get the money from Uncle Sam and he feels that he's got his part, but we also fill the gap for our citizens. So it's a cat and mouse game back and forth. So I look at a lot of those policies and how those things come to play. And believe it or not, a lot of these policies are just based on people just saying, oh, I just want to do this. And that's what makes them very dangerous. And I think people mean well, but sometimes they don't have the you know exposure, but then it comes down to this thing, oh, here come these people from the city and the colleges coming over here to tell us what to do and social engineering and all this kind of stuff. And that's when you get into that, you know, Farmer Joe, he didn't graduate from um, high school or college, but he wants to go in there and tell everybody else how to um, how to teach their kids because he believes that these is right. I mean, these things are right, and his pockets are deep enough for him to say because that's how he got there, right? Because it costs money to get elected. We know that. So, so he's on the board. It didn't matter if he got a college degree or he's went to high school and he graduated, whatever. He's on the board and he's making the rules. 
And so that's where you get into a lot of these kind of things. And people ask, well, how do we get these weird kind of policies and this and that? You know, like this whole thing of um, CRT, the critical race theory. They don't, you know, people always talk about how they teach it in school and all that. No, they don't. Most people still can't tell you what critical race theory even is. <laughs> right? Because uh, <laughs> it, it, it's not that. It, it was something um, totally different. But somebody heard it as a buzzword. And they took it and they ran with it. And now, you know, it's, a, it's another thing now. Everybody, oh, they teach you critical race theory. What is it? You don't even know what it is. So how are you going to say, you know, they, they teach it? So we see a lot of that kind of thing. So I, I do a lot of that educating people, trying to help them understand, look, this is what it is. And once you understand this, then maybe we can have, the, you know, a more intelligent conversation, you know, about these kind of things. So I spend a lot of time um, just educating the general public on things and policies and say, okay, this is what you might want to do. And here's why, but that's your decision. And that's one thing I'm big on, even in my church and salvation, you know, God has always given us one thing. He's given us the, the right to choose no matter in any and every situation. He's always giving you the right to choose. I may not like your choices. Your choices might be contrary to his word, but it was still your choice. And everywhere in the Bible, you always have a choice. And then, you know, even he told him, he said, choose you to stay who you're going to serve. He said, for me and my house, we choosing to serve the Lord. It's your choice. And even in these other things, all these things are your choice. So I always tell people, I don't ever want to take away anybody's ability to choose. That's when I think I violated you. Man, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. But yeah, so let's... um. Let's take that segue um, that you were you're talking about. So you get this uh, you get this money, uh, yeah. <laughs> the award, and you decide to buy a kayak. Now, were you already fishing at that time, or um, or is this something that 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 was relatively new? Man, I've been a fisherman, country boy, outdoor boy my whole life. Man, I deer hunt, I bow hunt, um, bear hunt. I do them all. Um, turkeys, uh, you know, I have a little trophy room here. I got fish, I got turkeys, I got deer. Um, and actually, not since I've been in the kayak fishing, I've really cut hunting to a minimum. I don't think I went, I didn't even go at all last year. Can't believe that I didn't go at all. Um, because I guess catch and release now has made me just change my mind about shooting deer. I'm just I'm, I'm being honest. I know some people are like, you gotta be kidding me, man. I, it's just something different now. I mean, because I can see this and do it again another day. And now if we got to eat, I'm going to do what I got to do. But I know I don't, I'm blessed and I don't need to do it. So I guess I've really turned into a trophy hunter for sure now. And even then it's kind of like, oh man, it's just so pretty. And I'm just taking in the moment. So as you get older, things start to change, man. Then I'm thinking about that drag and all that stuff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you ever drove, you know, 150 pound dead weight deer, even after you feel dressed it, man. You start changing your mind on some stuff like, man, do I really want to shoot this? Uh, you know, if it ain't, you know, I always tell them, I say, if it ain't got a drop time on his head, I'm probably not going to pull the trigger. You know, I got to see it. It was cool. You know, now bow hunting is a little different for me because I get that close, I might have to pull it because, you know, you <laughs> get a handful of shots. But, um, yeah, the fishing thing, I've always been fishing my whole life. i um, been growing up in the country. Um uh, I didn't have any guns, so hunting was something I got into more of as an adult, not because I didn't want to, but I just couldn't afford to. You know, my father, we didn't have firearms in our home. Um, BB guns was, you know, daisy, you know, single action. <laughs> that was right. all I had. Uh, that was the closest we were going to get. But fishing, it was easy to get, you know, fishing reels and that thing. And we had a pond that was not far from the house. So I found myself, I've always been a reader. And my mom would take us to the library in the summers, and I would go in there and check out all the fishing books. So I taught myself how to fish, and um, and I made all kinds of baits and all kinds of things for catfish, and that's really what I you know was doing, um, was you know with, you know go bassing, but you know a lot of time we spent a lot of time catching catfish and doing that kind of thing. So fishing was always in my purview, but the kayak fishing was completely new. Um, to me. And what happened was uh, we moved to our home here in Summerfield back in 2019, right before the pandemic started. And we was getting an alarm put in our house. And the guy from the alarm company, I can't remember his name now. He's going to kill me because he <laughs> fished out of CKA. <laughs> um, man, what is his Ryan. Ryan. Oh, what is Ryan's last name? 
But um, anyway, Ryan was my CPI representative that was putting the alarm in my house. And he saw I had all these catfish and reels over in the corner. And he's like, oh, you fish? And we got to talk about fishing. He was like, yeah, I'm a kayak fisherman. You know, we got these trails. And, and he was telling me about the kayaks. And, you know, they cost six, $7,000 by the time you do all this stuff. And, you know, he really had me going. I was like, you know what? I might want to try that one day. And he was encouraging. Oh, you should try it. You know, da, da, da. Yeah, and it went from there. Didn't think nothing about it. Pandemic happens. We're out. And um, but I win this you know, award. So I won that award in like around this time, April. So I got that check about mid-April and went out and said, um, I'm gonna go to buy a kayak. Went over to um Sportsman Warehouse in Greensboro and bought a Lost Creek um Pearl Drive kayak for like eleven hundred bucks. It was like the only one they had in the store. I saw a guy on the line, it was like a 10-footer. Went out to um a pond here in the neighborhood. First time I ever seen a Ned rig, I think I saw Brian Latimer was selling them Z-Man. I said, let me, I said, what is that? Threw a Ned rig. I think the first time I threw it, the first or second time I threw it, hung a fish, fought with them eight minutes. I said, man, this got to be a catfish. Man, I caught like a nine-pound bass. <laughs> <laughs> I got a picture of it. So I got a video. Now, I kid you not. I didn't even know fish were like that in that lake. We just moved to the neighborhood. Right, and, uh, and I'm like, I'm here. I am putting this kayak in there, going, you know, going, and just messing around. And it was, I never forget, it was July the fourth. I caught it on July the third, in ninety degree weather. I caught him off a of mid rig, and it was ridiculous. And I was like, oh my god, it was almost the biggest fish in my life. I don't think it was the biggest, but it was next to the biggest, you know, far as bass. And I was, I was sold on the kayak from that point. And so at this point, I'm in this kayak every day because it's the pandemic. It's the summer. Mm -hmm. You know, kids are home, wife's here, mother-in-law, you know, stays with me. So I'm gone. I am um, <laughs> to the point that I wore out the the um steering mechanism on it. The the cables in it broke. So I'm trying to find the cables, you know, it's off brand kayak, and I go over to Will and get outdoors. <laughs> so it was kind of cool that you played that before. And I go there, I say, Hey, can you fix this? And he's like, Well. You know, it may take this and that. We really don't do this kind of thing, but we you know. So I'm like, okay. So then I'm looking around, and he has all these other kayaks in there. And he was like, oh, yeah, we can't keep them in the store right now. People buying them left and right. And I walk over, and he has the native. <laughs> the native Slayer Max. He said, yeah, that's brand new. I just took that out of the box. And I went over there, and I looked at it, and I stepped in it. And he said, yeah, that'll be gone by the end of the day. And I said, yep, because it's gone right now. So I hundred percent impulse buy. I buy a Slayer Max out from Wheel over at Get Outdoors, and that was how I started um, kayak fishing. And my first tournament was I fished with Vinny in Queen City in his um, August tournament for the charity, the Emerald Charity that his wife does for the school that she runs. And I was like, okay, it's a charity event. It'll be level playing field because everybody's got to use the baits that they give you, which I thought was unique. So I said, okay, let me go ahead and see what happens. And that was my first time. The first time I ever stepped foot in the boat was in a tournament on Lake Wiley down there with Vinny at um, Queen City, man. So after that, I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, uh, so you are. You're fishing. Um, are you still fishing mostly uh, Queen City or CKA or CCKF? Uh, who all are you fishing with? I do all of them, man. I know. I know you're like, how do you find time? Man, I have a great wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I really do try to play because that's my that's my my release, man. Um, I spend a lot of time. That's the one time I can get on the water. I typically don't answer my phone, no anything. So that's the time I get to decompress. Um, so you asked about how I do all these things I do. That is really my time to decompress is just when I'm there and I find it to be, you know, my release. Some people, you know, I used to be a weightlifter and that, but, you know, the pandemic, again, kind of took that away from me. So it was, a, what else could I do? And I got in back into fishing like I did when I was younger, man. And and it's just kind of, um, you know, taking off. So, yes, I, I fish all three clubs, um, you know, but I think membership wise right now, I was fortunate enough, I fish the... Uh, Queen City this year for free. I want a free year membership. <laughs> so I've been fishing Queen City for free all this year. And um, but then I am a paid member of CCKF. 
Um, and I did fairly well. I made it to the um, the Tournament of Champions in that one last year. So I got to go back because I, I left some on the board last year over there. I, I could have pulled it out. That was – it was my fault. And um, – and then CKF, um, I do fish them, you know, great guys. And, uh, you know, Henry Bajagan is my guy. Love me some Henry and and getting to know the other guys, Byron and and then, of course, Ryan and and Don Trail. So um, just a group, group, a good group of guys. And I really fish a lot with them when they come to, of course, Carl Lake. That's my lake. And they do the combine when we do uh, North Carolina versus Virginia. And um, Virginia's been spanking us pretty good the last couple of times. So we got to figure that out. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, um, this is my this is my first first year doing any of it. So, uh, oh, okay. and uh, of course, my first <laughs> my first tournament, my first in person tournament is uh, uh, the Sharon Harris event, and it was on <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> now I'm in a paddle kayak. <laughs> Ooh, we gotta fix that. We gotta fix that. We gotta get Will to hook you up, man. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> All the all the pedal kayaks are too heavy. I car top. <laughs> oh no, I got a couple of I got a friend of mine here that I met. And that's the thing about kayak fishing. You meet so many people on yeah, the water. Sure. I kid you not. Guy who's fishing in CCKF now with us, um, Storm. Storm and I, um, and his first tournament was with you. And yep. I told Storm I was not going out there, buddy. Storm <laughs> is down the street from me. And I met Storm while I was in my kayak at um at the um the lake up the street. He was out there fishing on the pier. He got to talking to me. We just kept, we traded numbers. He works at the Harris Tito down the street from me. And so we just kind of hit it off like that. Next thing I know, Storm went and bought him a native. <laughs> and he puts it on top of his car. Wow. <laughs> so, so that's no excuse. You can get it. If Storm can get that Slayer Max on top of his Bible, you can get it on top of your car. <laughs> um, but yeah, he does. And um, so, like I said, that's the thing. Once you get there, you know, um, and we've done some creative, other creative things too. It's like, okay, how can we do, stack two kayaks? Um, David, um, Dave Hart and I did that one time. We went out to um, uh, where was that place? Canes Creek, out in between Chapel Hill. Great little fishing hole. I hope I ain't giving away too many secrets. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, Dave and I went out there because you know it's one of those things. You have, it's a lottery. You have to put in for the lottery. And um, and Dave, I don't think he ever been. And I was like, you need to go with me if you're gonna be off. And we got. He was off. I won the lottery that week, and you know you could take somebody with you, and um and Dave and I went out there, and it was like you know um you couldn't pull a trailer, so him and I went to a we stopped on the side of the road, and he left his car at a um at a grocery store, and we um took kayaks, and I said man you can put it on top of my kayak, I don't care, so I, you know we took everything off the kayaks and laid them face to face, and then strapped them down, put the stuff in the back of my truck, and drove because you can't pull a trailer in there. And um and drove in there, guy cleared us, we went in there, man. We had a great time, man. We caught about 40 bass that day. That's <laughs> awesome. So <laughs> yeah, so I definitely um, you know, we this is gonna be a long podcast, I can tell. Um, <laughs> but uh I definitely want to uh, make sure that we get a chance to uh to to touch on your face story too. Um so kind of kind of give us an idea of of what it is that you believe and how you came to believe that. So as I was saying earlier, um, I grew up in the church. I've been in church, you know, all my life, but didn't really take my faith seriously until I was about 15. Um, I believe that um, Jesus died and Jesus um, is coming back. You know, he rose and he's coming back again. I believe in the fivefold ministry uh, by most people say, you know, I'll be Pentecostal, but I claim apostolic that we follow the teachings of the apostles. I know that's a little nuances between those for some people, but I don't keep that. You know, if you believe in the um, death, burial, and resurrection, then we can have a conversation. The rest of that is just, you know, doctrine um, that you may have. I do believe in um, being baptized in the name of Jesus. I do believe in infilling with the gift of the Holy Ghost as this um, tongues, um, as utterance. But I also believe in, he said that the fruits would follow them. So, you know, you can be speaking in tongues and still be a devil, but at the same time, I want to see what you're doing. Um, you know, how you treat people. Do you treat people right? You know, um, so I want to see that work. You know, faith without works is dead. So um, uh, that's what I believe, you know, in a nutshell. I do believe in holiness. Um, we try to live a clean life. I don't drink, no smoke. I've never done I've never done it anyway. Um, so um, not a perfect man. I've had my, my share of faults and things. 
um, struggled in college, um, like most young people at that time. Not that I was just a heathen or whatever, but you know, you want to explore and see some things and do some things. Um, so I went through that stage like everybody else, but God kept me. Um, met my wife pretty much as soon as I got out of college. Um, we um, got engaged, got married, and this year we'll be 20 years in October. So, um, you know, and she's of the, you know, of the faith, and, um, and it was very important to me. It was always taught, you know, don't be unequally yoked. So one of the things that were key to me in marriage was I had to find somebody who believed exactly the way I believe. Because what, what happens is, and it's happening in our marriage, and it happens in others, marriages and things break down. Things happen. But she believed this way, and I knew I believed this way. So we had nowhere else. When we got down to that point, it got down to our faith, and we both knew we, what we believed. So then it was nothing but to go back up from there. And we've had, you know, over 20 years now, we've had those times, you know. Um, you know, we had ups and downs. And, you know, life has happened to us in various, you know, formats. But, you know, we got to that point. It's like, I know she believed this, and I believe this. So now we got to figure it out. And, and stick in here and keep going. And so here it is, 19 and a half years later, um, she's still in here with me. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful. So that would be, you know, my, you know, faith story in um, in, in a nutshell of you know, how I started. So like I said, my faith has been a, a progression. Like I said, you know, um, the Bible talks about growing from milk to meat. And um, it's definitely been a walk and a perfecting thing. As Paul said, I die daily. And I continue to die daily. There's things I'm always learning and I'm always, you know, changing and and growing. And um, and prayer changes things. And prayer is working on me and working on my family, and taking us to you know that level. So um, for my faith, that's kind of um where I would be in there and how I am where I am now. And even now, as you know, things happen, you know, around us. Um, on our job, I mean, in our churches, um, I was for a while. Um, I learned a lot. I grew up in a mainly African American church, but then when I came to Winston, um, I was in a mixed race church, and that was a very, you know, very interesting um, situation um, for me. And I learned a lot from that. And now, you know, like I said, my church is, you know, it's open. It's not even my church; it's God's church, and it's, you know, open. Who, whosoever will, but you know, we have a tendency to, you know, to attract who you are. So um, it is what it is. And um, that's where we go. So which I find it's interesting that most of my congregation are people or well, very educated people, which I guess, you know, as I tell people, people think that faith was for the poor because they think, oh, that's for people. Faith. No, I know a lot of people in high places that believe exactly you know, what we believe is just that um, things are a little different. And I believe that God has called some modern day Joseph, some modern day Daniels. Who, who are on these levels, who speak to these people, and they have to have some integrity because I'm telling you, I see a lot of stuff a lot of times that ain't right. And somebody's got to stand up and say something about it. And you're going to take some blows. You're going to take some slack for it. But you got to trust and know at the end of the day that um, God is going to protect you. And I'm here to say that, you know, I've caught some blows, but he's protecting me every single time. And um, even when it didn't feel like it was, man, <sighs> If I can go into detail some things, you'll be like, whoa, I can't believe that even happened. Um, you know, yeah, I, I had some crazy stuff happen, man. And I'm, I'm here to tell you today that integrity, time and time again, really who you are. You don't really know who you are until that stuff. As they used to say in the streets, when it hits the fan, you're fine. <laughs> and, um, you know, and every now, every couple of years or whatever, God has a way of sending something my way to test my integrity. And it's like, oh, I could have said this, or I could have did this. And maybe nobody finds out, but I know. And because of the, you know, the guy that lives inside of me, having to live with myself and do that, I don't think I could do it. So, um, so I'm one of those ones I didn't told on myself. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, but that would be, uh, my, my faith walk. And like I said, you know, I struggle like everybody else. I'm not, you know, perfect and I never claim perfection, but I do believe that, you know, we can walk this together. And that's why it's important that we we strengthen one another and we, you know, we hang out with one another and help each other. And then sometimes, you know, the Bible says, you know, iron sharp is iron. And one of the things about iron sharpening iron is this causes, most people don't think about it, but it causes friction. And what happened with friction is that as these things are rubbing each other, the reason they sharpen each other is because they not they knock spurs off each other. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I don't know about you. You take you know, that hurts to knock some stuff off, and that's why you know you have that friction. But we, but because we're committed to staying in there, at the end of the day, we end up being you know sharper for it when we go out to do what we got to do. So um, I do believe in um, healthy, you know, healthy debate, healthy discussion. But at the end of the day, um, it's all love. Um, something um, there were there were a few things that that you said that I'm definitely going to be um, be listening to again and and taking notes. Um, <laughs> but one thing that that really stood out to me, um, you you said several times, die daily. Uh, that you die daily. Um, if if we've got anybody who's listening who isn't really familiar with with what that phrase means, I, I call it the Christianese. Um, it, if anybody isn't fluent in Christianese and doesn't quite uh, uh, know what that one means, can you you kind of break that down for us? Yeah, um, die daily would be that um, as Paul said that you know I know there's things that I've done that was contrary to the word of God, whether it was intentional or unintentional because there's sometimes things that you do unintentional that you still held accountable for. If you if you broke the law, if you was riding down the street and you was going faster than you should have been going, you might not have known the speed limit, but that didn't mean the man might not give you a ticket because your negligence didn't mean that you get to walk away from this. And because of that, um, I have to ask God for forgiveness daily. I mean, something I even could have thought of that was contrary to the word that could got me in trouble that led to something else. So when I say die daily, is you know, dying to those things and myself. You know, I'm in this body, so I'm constantly fighting my self-will all the time. You know, as they said, the, um, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? So there's things that my body wants to do. There's things that my mind wants to do. There's things that my mouth wants to say. But... I have to, you know, war against that because I always have a choice. I can choose to say it or choose not to say it. I can choose to do it or not to do it. And some days, I'm going to be honest, some days the body wins. And this is why we fast and this is why we die daily because I have to keep killing this guy because he keeps coming back. <laughs> He's like Freddy Krueger. He just won't go away. So, um, and that's the war. You, you hear people talk about the war, war inside of them or the silent war. That's the war. You warn against yourself all the time, you know, when I would do good, evil is always around, right? So, and we see many, many examples about it, you know, all the time throughout the Bible where they talk about this is what I want to do. Even, you know, Jesus fought. He, he said, What? In the Garden of Gethsemane, if I don't have to, please take this cup. I don't want to die like this. But nonetheless, not my will, but your will. What did he do? He died to himself right there. Not my will. Because what I want to do is I don't want to die. In fact, I want to go in here and just start slinging tables and all this stuff, right? You know, like he did one time, but he had to go, you know, so and not that Jesus sinned. Don't get me wrong, because he didn't sin. He said he anger, but he said not, right? So you can get upset, but you know, don't don't go do something crazy after that. You know, um, I ain't gonna take that shot I was gonna take. But anyway, so uh, I was gonna say Will Smith, but let me stop. <laughs> but, uh, you're going with that. <laughs> it's too easy. But uh, so we can have fun. But um, but nonetheless, um, that's what I mean by you know die daily. Um, so the things that you struggle with, we all struggle with them. But the difference is, is that I have the Holy Ghost to lead and guide me. And if I choose to listen, that's the difference. It's like who do you adhere to? He said, no man can serve two masters. You know, what both man and and um and in the world, you know, you're going, you can't choose two masters. You got to have one or the other. And so some days. I chose the other, <laughs> but it didn't mean he didn't let me. It didn't mean that, you know, I can't come back. I just want to get back in line. So it's a constantly um, relining yourself. Um, I'll give you this analogy and I'll shut up. Um, this thing of, I have this thing personally that I weigh myself every day. Cause I know me, my weight can get out of control. Cause sometimes I'm undisciplined in that area of my life. So I have to do it every day. Cause when I weigh myself, what I find out is okay. Oh, I'm a little light today. I can eat a little bit today. Or, oh, I'm a little heavy. I got to watch it. No sodas today. No Mellow Yellow, no Mountain Dew, whatever, right? So I can make sure. So when I get back on the scale the next time, I'm back in line. Okay, I'm back where I should be. Think about your spiritual walk with Christ like that. you always measuring yourself. And the more you measure yourself, the more aware you are. And the more aware you are, then the, hopefully you have the better decisions you can make. So the problem is, is when you're not measuring yourself for like weeks at a time, 
you know, so you always see that one thing on the church on the, on the, the church um, mantra that says, "Prayer without prayer with, for what? Without prayer for one week makes one week." Um, week w e e k w e a k. <laughs> um, so it makes one week in that week because you're not being able to measure up because it's so easy to get off. It doesn't take. And that's the problem, that I know, you know what, I could have got even if I was on my walk perfect. Let me go back and line up. Let me go back and line up. So that's that getting on the scale. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to do this. So that's the, that's how I see it. I know what I want to do. I'm going to do it. 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 I'm going to do distortion thing again. I don't know if it's a, a cable that is not yet. It's a brand new microphone here because I got two. I got another one here, but this huh. that better? It is. It is. Make sure I take my hands off the table. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so uh, it's, it's, here's a, a echo from me. Me. All right. So, um, um, we'll see. See. Where were we? <laughs> oh, you asked you, me about Don Bailey. You were talking about the uh, the the church mantra. It was the last thing that I got. Oh, you you asked me about dying daily. Right. So I was talking, yeah, dying daily, how I measure myself every single day. So that's what the dying daily is. It's like, okay, I need to kill this off today. Or I need to make sure I'm not doing this today. So it's like constantly um, back measuring back and forth. Um, that's how I would you know, say it. You know, that I'm very conscious of everything I'm doing. Absolutely. All right, man. So um, can't let you come on to the the Faith and Fishing podcast without asking you a few questions. There are some that we we uh, we ask every guest, um, and uh, my my favorite question of the whole podcast is is always, "What fishing story or memory means the most to you?" Uh, I don't have any that, that stick out like like this one's the most, but I have you know a group of them. Um, I guess if I had to pick one, I would say um, a trip where we didn't catch any fish. It was the fact that I was with my my family. One of my two, I have two brothers that are younger. I'm the oldest. And they both have boats. <laughs> I don't. I got the kayak. They got boats. <laughs> and um, and on the fourth of July or around my my, uh, my father's birthday, we used to get out. And my brother has a pontoon. We go out down Car Lake, and we stayed there all, all night. You know, the entire night. We go out about eight nine o'clock, and we come back in the next morning about ten o'clock. And uh, the last time we did it, man, we did not catch a single fish <laughs> <laughs> the entire night. Um, that's a long time to be on the water not catching fish, but we didn't catch a fish the entire night. But, um, but it was the fact that I was with my father, and I'm blessed to have my father. He's still alive. And then to be with my two brothers. Um, so um, it's a fishing is a, a family affair for us. And um, so I guess that would be, you know, my favorite one. But I do have a unique one in that um, I typically, this particular Sunday, um, I got to fish and it was fishing after um after church and I um, was able to go out to church and fish and I um, was fishing in the little farm pond with um my wife's cousin and um was throwing a little rubber worm and they always talked about how many you know fish was in this um this particular pond and I'd never done anything and I just remember I threw a little rubber worm over here in like a little cove and I just saw my line just take off it was gone. Snap back, hooked the fish, fought for like five or ten minutes, eight, eight and a half pound bass. Oh, snap. Okay. Like, yeah, this is going on the wall. At this time, that was a PB. Came around the pond, came back around to the same space. I threw that thing right back over there again. 
<laughs> Same thing happened again. Snag nine and a half pounds. I'm back. <laughs> Out the same exact hole, the same exact cast, and um, this was before I, I was before I was kayak fishing. This is probably like back in like I think it was two thousand eight. I think it was. Um, so I kept both of those fish. So I do have those two fish mounted in a massive a massive amount that I got from um, I got a guy to make like they chasing um bait fish. So it's huge, man. And I think that I went back and I measured the inches on them. One of them was like 27. The other was like 26. So <laughs> and a farm pond. And um, yeah, so I kept them. And I have not mounted a fish since, you know, because now I've learned better. But that was when I didn't know any better. And I was like, man, this is a nine and a half pound fish. So I said, I always told myself I'm not going to mount another fish unless it was, unless it was um, double digits. But now I tell myself I wouldn't do that now because I understand. I get it now. Even though it would be very tempting, <laughs> then, you know, you catch a, a 10 pound plus fish to mount them, but I, I get it. So I, you know, do my best to get a good picture and, and I got the memory logged. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if I, uh, I always tell myself that if I ever beat my dad's personal best, he's got it, he's got it mounted that it's, it's somewhere in that nine and a half pound range. If I ever beat that one, I, I'm going to get a replica made and I'm going to have it mounted um, in that way. Um, I, I can't bring myself to kill that, that size of a fish. Um, but, uh, or at least not a, not that size of a bass. Um, uh, there's definitely some out there that are bigger than that, that I'll keep to eat. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, just, just because, you know, you, you want to keep that, that those genes in the water, but, right. Um, right. But yeah, man. Um, whenever you're out fishing with somebody, uh, what's your typical conversation centered around? What are you talking about? I'm trying to find a fish, mostly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the last time fishing was storm, and then um, they most of the time my conversation is around that. But then you know it, it can just go to anything, you know, from school to family um, to different fishing techniques. So I don't have anything. You know, I'm a pretty open book. Um, there's really no subject off. Um, off limits with me because like I said, um, I am who I am. I live my life out loud and, uh, and I'm proud of who um, God has allowed me to be. So um, I'm usually talking, you know, we'll talk about anything from, you know, politics um, to, like I said, child rearing, um, finance, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm pretty spread on, you know, what I know and what I don't know. So there are a number of things I don't know. Those are always the interesting conversation when somebody's talking about something I don't know and I'm inquiring, asking more because I want to know more. Well, what about this? And what about that? Because I never know when I'm going to use that information. And that's one thing that's allowed me to connect with so many people is that um, I know a lot about, I, mean, I know a little bit about a lot of stuff. I ain't going to say I know it. I definitely don't know everything, but I know a, I know a lot about, a little bit about a lot of stuff. And what I find is that that's the way I normally connect to people, is, you know. You know, I meet people, I'm going through a list. Well, you do this or do you do that? I'm looking for a connection. And then from that connection, people have a tendency to relax. And then when they relax, then we can talk. So you talked about bass. Oh, but I know about thumping a bass. I can't play one. <laughs> but I know about thumping it because, you know, my uncles do it. Right. So it's kind of like the, um, what was that story? Was it the the life of Pi? Um, no, 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 not the life of Pi. But the one with the guy, it's an Indian, it's an Indian movie where the guy is playing the, um, who wants to be a millionaire? Oh, uh, Slim Dog Millionaire. Yeah. Slim Dog Millionaire. And you know how that movie, everything he answers is based on something that kind of happened to him. I kid you, that's my life. <laughs> I kid you not. That's how my life is. I meet somebody and be like, and it'd be like something that happened to me. Like the kayak, like the kayak. Ryan was at my house. He was putting in. He was doing his job. We crossed paths on that. He said that. I said that. Oh, opportunity presented itself. I got a kayak. Oh, this is wonderful. I mean. You know, that's how I pick, you know, golf and 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 chess and all these other things. It's, it's literally have been situations like the Slim Dog Millionaire. It's just I happen to be into something <laughs> and, and it just kind of um, worked out. I don't know, you know, how old you are, but I don't know if you remember this one TV show that used to come out called the um, Quantum Leap. And, I, and that's one of my favorite shows of all time. And I always felt that my life is like the quantum leap. And I'm Sam Beckett. And that I leap from situation to situation. Literally, 
I really do. I really do believe that. <laughs> and um, my life, I'm a fixer. That's one of the things I do. I do the hard stuff. I do. I'm a foundation guy. I go in there and we change stuff and get it going. And when we get it going, as soon as I think I'm about to enjoy it, I leave and I'm in another situation. And I'm like, okay, now I'm, and I spend all my time trying to figure out, okay, why am I in this one? And as soon as I figured it out, yes, we're going, and I'm gone again. And I can show I can show you that throughout my whole career, my in my in my jobs and in my life and other things and other people and other places and situations that it's become you know that Sam Beckett type deal. So um, quantum leap. If you haven't watched it, I know I'm aging myself, but uh, that um, awesome. It's an awesome um, story. I think it's on Netflix now. <laughs> yeah, I've um, I, I've I've definitely seen this show. I I. I didn't watch it like new episodes coming out. Um, it may it may have been on TV while I was old enough to watch it, um, but it, it was it wasn't until um, about ten years ago that I, that it came on like reruns on a on a TV show a TV network or something that I I sat down and watched it. But yeah, that's a that is a good show. Um, but yeah, man. So with every guest, uh, we always do a segment called "What's Your Favorite." It's self-explanatory. Um, I'm going to ask your favorite in a few different categories. But to start us off, man, what is your favorite scripture? The, the world's favorite scripture, John three sixteen, right? These I'm a God of the world. <laughs> you gave the second, right? so, so whosoever leaving him should not perish, but should have everlasting life, right? Um, that one, and then of course the um, the four uh, Matthew four nineteen that he'll make you fishers of men. Uh, my name is Peter. I don't think that's by accident. That's awesome. That is so awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, I always uh, I always refer to John three sixteen as the thesis statement of the Bible. That's mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how I've always viewed it. What about a particular story from the Bible? Is there one of those that's your favorite? I lean a lot on that whole, I call it like the trilogy from Abraham down to Isaac. I just think that whole lineage of back in Genesis is just interesting. How God, you know, gives Abraham, you know, Isaac and then, you know, and then Isaac, begin, you know, he doesn't kill him. And, you know, Jacob and Jacob, you know, does all the things trying to get, you know, um, Rachel and ends up with Leah. And then he has all these sons and now you have all these tribes and, you know, a lot of people miss that. That's, it's a very, very rich story. You know, and now you got with the tribe of Judah and from Judah, you know, which is, um, if I recall correctly, I think that was like his last daughter, I mean, his last son by the original Leah wife, which is a very interesting thing. Cause remember he didn't want her to, be, to begin with, but she ends up having the lineage of Jesus Christ through the tribe of Judah Right. You know, from Jesse to David to ben. I mean, it's just nuts when you start to look at that. It's like, oh, that's great. He didn't even want her, but it ended up being the lineage of Jesus Christ, which was like her last son. That's nuts, right? But what he wanted, then it's still special because he has Joseph, and Joseph saves them and he brings them to Egypt, and that's how they get to Egypt, and then they get exiled because of you know, you just start bringing out it. You know, I love that part, man. So that whole little it's not one story, it's just that one little caveat of how they even get to Egypt. So from, um, you know, Abraham start in his walk with, you know, his wife, you know, at the time, Sarah, I think it's the Bible calls her, until, you know, they get to Egypt when, you know, Joseph brings them into Egypt to save them. Uh, I just like that whole stretch, man. I just get so much out of it every time I read it. And I, I've, I, I've fallen in love with, with Esau. Um, so. Uh, just that that story of you know him having his birthright stolen from him and Jacob running away in in fear and then uh, whenever they finally do uh, do get back together it's not a it, it's it's an embrace like Esau's happy to see him and and has forgiven him and I, I I've I've recently recently fallen in love with that part of 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 that particular of that particular story. Um, what was always interesting me about that story is the father's role in that, right? Uh, you know how he was like, he's feeling him, he's hairy, he's feeling like a deer here. I'm like, 
does a deer feel like anything like, you know, <laughs> you know how she dresses him up, right? To be like he's Esau. And I never got that part. I was like, man, you know, this is before wigs, man. So what are they using? You know, sheep, yeah. lamb, I mean, lamb wool. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm a hairy dude. But nobody's going to walk up and feel a deer thinking they're feeling me. <laughs> it, 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 that's what I'm saying. So that's the whole part that it always kind of gets me on that. I mean, I get it. He's he's pretty much blind, right? All right, right? So I get that part. And I guess maybe, you know, I can smell the outside. You know, my wife said, you smell like outside. You know, so I, maybe I can get that part. But, you know, how you touch it, my I just, <laughs> that part is what gets me. But, hey, it is what it is. Yeah, but, yeah that story, yeah, that is a, um, a story of, you know, embracing redemption. And then the whole thing of, that whole thing with Jacob being the trickster, how even out of him being a trickster, but then God brings this whole birth, this whole nation to him, man, and changes his name and knocks his hip out of place and all this kind of stuff. And so you think when he goes through all this stuff, you know, and you know, it's and he gets tricked for being a trickster, and you know, he gets the well, I'm thinking, well, shoot, man, you got good. Look at the trick you got, man. You had two wives. It was having babies by everybody. Matter of fact, maybe he has babies by the, the maid too, right? So I think people forget that part. They just always talking about Rachel and Leah. But remember, she got, okay, I can't do it. So you just go in and you sleep with the maid. These guys were just getting hard. You think it you see what I'm saying? So think about it. he has a couple of kids by the maid too. Most people don't realize that. They don't think about that part. Some of his kids were the maid kids. Go back and read it. It says that. And then he went with the maid servant and he had this one and this one and this one. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Just like his granddad at that point, right? Because he had different Ishmael. Yeah. Ishmael. That's right. All right. So, what is your favorite fish to catch? I like catching stripers. It's something about the striped bass, man. I just, I, I like it. I don't get to catch a bunch of them. They're so heavily regulated, and I get it. I get it. But the striper, dude, you ever get one of hit, man? Just, it's just, yeah. I I like striped bass. I've never caught a big one. I've, you know, I've always caught, like, you know, the 17, 18 inch, or you can take home and fry them up or whatever. But you don't fry them. You want to bake those. But, um, <laughs> I do like the striper though. Um, okay. The striper is a good fish to catch. You know, obviously bass. You know, because bass do all the action, but that striper, that's a that's a man, sure. man's fish. And what about your favorite fish to fish for? Obviously, the you know the bass. Um, crappy plays a, a, a close second, but the thing about crappy, once you find them, I mean, you just you know they just all there. You know, right. so you just gonna keep getting them. Versus a bass, you know, they'll just uh, sometimes they'll fool you. They'll be in places you don't think they were going to be at. You know, I never forget, you know, this earlier this year, when we fished um, CCKA, it was as hot as I don't know what in July. You know how July is in North Carolina. And I can just feel the steam coming off that lake. And I was in like two foot of water. And I had already pretty much given up. And I threw a jig up under this tree in like two foot of water. And I just said, something didn't feel right about that. And I, I just set the hook. Like a seven, eight pound bass coming out of the water. Out in two foot of water. And you know, everybody said the water like 80, 90 degrees. Why is he in two foot of water? Up under this window. I mean, it's not even a shade tree, it was just like a little tree nut that's hanging over the water. He was under there. And I just happened to just pitch a little jig under there. And boop. So that's the thing about bass, they, they do that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And about 40 foot of water too. I mean, you're like, well, why is he out here? And it'd be a little <laughs> at 40 foot of water. It's like, dude, you're trying to be lunch out here at 40 foot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing about them, man. They always surprise you. Absolutely. And what about your favorite fish to eat? Uh, I'm a flounder guy. I do not eat freshwater fish except the straw. <laughs> but he's technically a saltwater fish. Right. Um, we just don't do it. We when I say we, we in general, we don't do a good job with our freshwater fisheries. You know, the fertilizers and all this stuff. I just, I've caught fish with sores and all kinds of stuff in them. And um, so I just believe in, you know, the salt water does do something to help the fish. So I'm a salt water guy when it comes to fish. Um, freshwater, I catch them all day, catch and release. 
Um, but uh, I do not partake. When I was younger, I did, you know, but you know, and I don't eat catfish at all. Okay. All right. And since we're since we're talking about food, what's your favorite fish and snack? Man, I'm a candy guy. I told y'all that. I take them sweet tarts, man. I need to stop eating those things. I know it's just straight sugar tablet. <laughs> you know the little hard ones? Straight sugar tablet. I would sit there and I would crush, I don't know how many packs of those things out there. Because <laughs> they're easy to put in your pocket, just popping in your, you know, like a tab and Couple of seconds gone, and you're doing it again and again yep. and again. So yep. I might do a bunch of sweet tarts most of the time. All right. And so I won't ask for GPS coordinates or secret spots or anything, but what's your favorite body of water to fish? Well, like I said, GPS, I'm not into that. I mean, fishing to me, this is like a, a release point for me. So I don't care about that, man. I just, if you catch a fish there, you catch a fish there. I'm not one of those guys. Um, right now, I'm stuck between two bodies. I've been, I really like Jordan, even though it's a, it's a little bit of dry. But um, I've had a lot of success on High Rock Lake, and it's, it's growing on me, which is not that far from me either. So it's about, they both about the same. Um, I've cashed every time, as they said, knock on wood, I've cashed every time I've, I've fished High Rock Lake. Um, I made my first check on High Rock Lake with, um, with Queen City last year. I mean, I had a phenomenal day. Never fished it before. First time I went there was that day. <laughs> um, and then we had, um, they did that thousand, he did that thousand dollar hour bass back in December. I caught the first bass, first thousand dollar bass in High Rock. I only went to High Rock because it was closest to my house. That was the main reason. That was why I went. I said, it's the closest. I just go out there. I didn't pay my money. It's December. And I think Maybe eight cast in, I pull in like a six pound off a off a crank bait. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'm stuck between those two. Um, so Jordan or High Rocket, like so High Rocket, I would say Jordan, but High Rocket is definitely growing on me. Absolutely, and um, I don't want you to give away too many secrets. But what's your favorite lure to throw? I love a spook, man. I got on that spook last year, and that thing was money, man. I just, um, a sexy dog. Um, my buddy of mine told me, you know, I bought it last year to fish Harris. He said, oh, throw this in the wintertime. And um, I didn't really, I didn't do anything on it. And I started messing around with it last year. I caught an eight-pound off for it last year in May. Um, and I started doing that. So every year I've had a thing that I try to teach myself one new lure. That, and I, I, fish, a, I fish a jig probably. 75% of the time, though. Um, I'm a big fish guy. If I'm going to get it, I'm, sw I'm swinging for the fence every time, man. <laughs> and so that's why I don't think I'm, I'm trying to balance the two because when I'm, I'm looking at my tournament numbers, as I look on Tourney X, I mean, my average seven, I was averaging 17 inches. So I'm catching big fish. I'm just not catching enough of them. Right. Now I got to figure that part out. <laughs> so. yeah, I'm definitely going to have to uh, to pick your brain at some point on the on fishing at jig I, I haven't gotten in with i started story. two years ago um just i told myself exactly what i'm telling you i was gonna know how to do it i just went out the whole day i do nothing but that that's really how i learned them do nothing but that and i finally got bit maybe six hours in and i thought like, oh that's all this is and after that point last year like i said i caught i caught especially at um at lake jordan I think every time I went, I never won the tournament, but I always caught a big fish out there. And that's what I was saying. We had the the CKK, the C um C the CCKF final there. I had big fish. <laughs> he was on the front of my bow. <laughs> and he got stuck. I never I never the whole year I never fished with a motor. And I got me the spot lock motor. And I'm going to use this to do this like cover water. Because like I said, my problem is I'm catching fish, just not enough of them. So I'm, like, I'm going to cover all this water. And sure enough, I think and it, it was a slow day. So if you would have caught a limit, you was going to win. I think Matthew, shout out to Matthew. Matthew won that, right? And I think the, the fish he ended up bringing in for big fish was like 19 inches. I had every bit of 24. And uh, again, on the jig, had them. 
Fish came out. I'm fighting him, I'm fighting him. I think I'm about to give him the boat. He runs to the front of the bow. As he runs to the front of the bow, he wraps around the trolling mode. Only time I've ever fished with the trolling mode. Ever. And I can see him. He's out the water like this and his tail. I'm a big guy. The water's freezing cold. Don't want to end up in this water. The fish is on this. I got to pull the motor up. Let's try to see if I can get it off. So I'm like, man, what I'm going to do? And I'm about like nine for the water. But I'm close enough to show. So if I hit this water, I can get out, you know, fairly quickly. So I'm like, so I start to lay over and I'm pulling up to the side to pull the thing off. And as I finally get it up, somehow he came off. And that fish, I mean, when you see a fish whose tail was big as your hand, I was like, I knew, oh, I knew every bit I had him. Um, and I think that day, like I said, I don't, I don't think about the caught of them because <laughs> it was that, you know, it was one of those days, man. Right. Um, yeah. So the jig has been good to me. Um, like I said, I'm not one of those ones. I, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like I think about things like this when you, you know, when people talk about hiding stuff. You put a you put a golf club in my hand or Tiger Woods' hands. You can give me his golf club and tell me how to do everything, but I ain't gonna be able to swing it like him. He has the talent and skill, and he's put forth that effort. So I can tell you exactly where to go and exactly what to do. Don't mean you're gonna catch the fish. Because you know it's one of the things you gotta do. So um that's me. I know everybody don't subscribe to that. So, like I said, I'm an open book, man. I just want to have fun and enjoy life. It ain't that serious to me. I don't fish for the money. I fish for the competition. The money's a byproduct. <laughs> all right. And now that all of our hearts are broken from your from your big big one that got away story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Not least. Um, what's your favorite time of year to fish? Actually, I'm a summer guy. Like right when it's 100 million degrees. I've had my most success, and I look over the years, and I look over my tourney eggs. I've killed them in the middle of the summer, and I and I think I know why. Because as growing up, I was always told you want to fish in the summer, so I learned how to fish. I learned how to fish in the summer, mm-hmm. and it won't until I got into kayak fishing that I even fished in the winter. Um, Benny had us out there at J- Lake James, and it was like 30 degrees. And the water was like 31 degrees. And in fact, you see the smallmouth that's jumped out. That was a smallmouth I caught at Lake James in 30 degrees of water. Never caught fish in that kind of cold water. Um, so that's why the summer, the fall, I was always in a tree stand. I was told, you know, I grew up in one of those areas. I was too cold to fish. Mm-hmm. So all these things that I found out I was always told are absolutely wrong. Oh, you don't fish in the rain. Absolutely. I want to go when it's raining now. Oh, it's too windy. I absolutely want to be out there when it's windy now. But these are all things I told you know, that they had to be perfect. They wanted my father wanted to be a little bit, a little bit cool, uh, still water, everything, everything that we do wet that you don't normally catch fish in. And I think that's why I sail in the summer because that's how I learned how to catch them in the worst condition ever. But in their mind, because the way they were taught from other people was these were the best days to go fishing when it was nice and sunny and the water was calm. Which are you, you, we all know what it's the worst time to go. <laughs> so. Absolutely, and I, I think another thing is you know a lot of throughout your career you worked at a school where you were off in the summer, um, so that's whenever you got to put in the time on the water, and it, all fishermen always say time on the water is that's how you get that's how you get good at it, um, so. I think that has has a lot to do with it too. Um, you very well true, but the winter is starting to get. Dude. I just don't like the cold, but I am starting to do. I am starting to favor this winter fishing because I've caught some. When I started, I mean, the biggest fish I have caught have been in the winter. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, we're going to start wrapping things up. Um, if you would uh, let us know what is coming up next for Doctor Peter Ely. Ooh. Um, just grinding, man. Um, you know, working with our church and um, just working to continue to be able to help people and help them find their level in Christ and find what it is that they ask them to do. We work off a um, this um, mantra in our church. We call it DEA, Discipleship, Empowerment, and Accountability. I'm going to help you. I'm going to empower you, but I'm going to hold you accountable. So that's really where we are on the on the fishing side. My goal this year is to um. 
I would like, to, you know, Queen City got some real hammers in there, man. They got some guys. I, I need to break. I broke the top ten last year. You know, like I said, I, I cashed out in one of the tournaments last year there. But um, obviously you like to win one. But to me, again, it ain't about the money. It's competition. I do well. God has blessed me. But it's about the competition. And I would like to make the tournament of champions there. That would be nice. Um, again, I got the competition because, to be honest, the way the tournament of champions is set up, I probably won't even make it. Um, the fish it because they, you know, they fish on Sundays, and I don't do Sundays, you know. So that would be one of the ones. If I made it, I know I made it, but I'll probably get my spot up unless my church said, no, you go. <laughs> but, um, but that's one of the things I want to do, you know, for, you know, on the fishing side and far as, you know, at work. Just continue to help, you know, our kids. Our kids need help. You know, we're dealing with this pandemic. There are some significant losses. There are some significant gains. And to be able to help teachers and community leaders find out what those losses and gains are for their communities and try to get our kids back in position and, as they say, sort of speak, back on track um, to um, help them um, finish with, you know, what they were working on and that they can be productive citizens in our society going forward. Absolutely. And um do you i want to give you an open floor for if you've got sponsors or supporters anybody you want to say thank you to all those kinds of shout outs you go for it so at the time i do not have any sponsors but i've been trying <laughs> but if anybody wants to sponsor pd Early, please by all means do so because i sponsor a lot of you all but um, no <laughs> i really do um, I, I, don't, I don't know how many cash and rods i own <clears throat> cash and yes i own several um Right down the street of um, Sanford, I go down that. I go in the store and buy them, um, twenty twenty fifty dollars a piece. But no, but they make great equipment. Um, I fish a lot of True South jigs. Um, <clears throat> True South, yeah. Um, their jigs. I mean, he do make good jigs, man. I got to get to them. His jigs are just phenomenal. I don't even want to buy them out of the store. I just want to buy his. Um, that maybe that's what it is. His jigs are good. Uh, also. Um, Kayak Fishing with Christ. Those are my brothers on the water. I really have come to be very fond of that group, Santiago, um, Kent Vanover, all those guys. Many of them I've never met. I met Kent, um, no, of Santiago. He did um, one of their gatherings here in North Carolina last year. I met him and um, Dave. But a um, great group of guys doing a great work for Christ through kayak fishing. So I really love that group. Really, um, those are my brothers on the water. So I want to give a shout out to Kayak um, Fishing with Christ. So if you're interested, it's an open group and um, you can just reach out to them um, on Facebook and, and ask to be a part and come on and fish with us. And um, we fish you know, monthly tournaments every month on that. And um, I think that's pretty much it. You know, obviously, you know, my wife and my kids for allowing me to go and, um, and do what I do and enjoy this time. And to you um, for reaching out to me. Um, I've listened to your podcast in the, in the past and, and, you know, bought some of the products. I think you know, the Saber. Um, yeah. So I bought Saber. So I bought a couple of them. <sighs> yeah. He tried to convince me to put them on my rise. Now I have a hard time putting it on those cash ones, man. I just don't want to cut them. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> but I haven't used them yet, but I bought them. I got it. I spent, like I said, I, I sponsor a lot of people. I spent almost $100. I got two or three of them. But I didn't put them on anything because my kayaks stay wet so much, so I'm concerned about that. You know, it's one of those things. You know how it works. If it's wet, it's gonna you know do its thing, which I think would be phenomenal. But as much as my wet, as wet as my yak stays, I don't know. That's the only. That's the problem. My main reason I did it, and um, I think yeah, that's pretty much it. So um, I do like using a lot of mom and pop stuff. So if you're a mom and pop guy, you need somebody to use them. Oh, bless bait. Uh, bless. Uh, Bless Vet Baits. Um, new guy just met out of Creedmoor. Um, he swears he has the best buzz bait on the market. Um, I'm not a, much of a buzz bait guy, but I'm going to definitely start throwing it when it warms up a little bit, and um, and see if you know if that's true. Because I you know I know that True South V Twin Buzz Bait is a rattle trap, buddy. That thing makes a lot of noise. So um, I want to give a shout out to him, and um, and like I said again, a shout out to you, Faith and Fishing um, Podcast. And um, that you all, and if you get the opportunity to go to my podcast, um, the gospel professor, um, dot podbean dot com, I think we're up to 800 podcasts roughly on there. Um, they're all messages of hope and um, and, and deliverance, all 100% free. 
And like I said, you know, I've been doing that for about five or six years now off the Podbean platform, gospelprofessor.podbean.com. Um, and just, you know, you can get you something to listen to um, to build your faith. Again, thank you um, for allowing me to be here. I'm just blessed to be here. And I'm blessed that you thought enough of me to invite me and I want to hear my story. Absolutely, man. And before I let you go, uh, what about social media? Um, and uh, if if our listeners want to follow you, uh, uh, learn more about you, um, I, I th- you mentioned a website earlier. Um, you know, plug all of that good stuff too. All right. So professional website is this Dr. Um, Peter Ely dot com, and that's where you see all my professional stuff. And then I need to update that. Then the church is the uh, the Safe House um, Church GSO, um, um, the Safe House Church GSO dot com. Um, you'll find us there, or you can just Google Safe House Church um, GSO. The SH, SH should pop up. And then um, social media, just usually you know, my name. Um, I just do a little bit of everything on that. I'm not branding or none of that kind of stuff. I just enjoy people. Um, enjoy serving the community. So you'll see on my Facebook, you'll see us talking about a little bit of everything on there. My Instagram is mainly um, me on bow ties. I wear bow tie every Friday. <laughs> That's my thing. So um, Fridays, I, I call them bow tie Fridays. And um, I found that people have been emailing me and a number of people I've connected with all around the world. Um, they, you know, they said, you know, they look forward to the bow tie Friday. So I was like, wow, you never know what little thing you're doing. I just did it as a whim. And it's kind of like a salute to um, a friend of mine who passed away. He used to wear a bow tie every day. And um, I said, like, you know, I just wear one every Friday for the, the whole academic year. And um, that's kind of how that started. And now it's become like you know, still the thing that it's a whole group of us who do it. These big time doctors, they got the blue check beside their name. You know, I don't have a check beside my name. They follow me because <laughs> we're doing it. They wear their bow ties in their, you know, their doctor offices and stuff. So, um, so on Twitter, that's um, again Dr. Peter Ely, this Dr. Peter Ely on Twitter. Like I said, mainly my stuff on Twitter is, you know, pretty much professional stuff and the bow tie Friday um, on Instagram and um, on Twitter. And that's pretty much, you know, it um, on the social media. Oh, I do have a um, YouTube channel that is um, Finding Fish, and on the Finding Fish YouTube channel, you'll find. That I, I've been touring with um, teaching people, you know, what I'm doing on the water and, and showing that thing. So I am out there. Like, so I'm easy to find. Just Google my name and click away and um, have fun. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show. I have I have thoroughly enjoyed this one. I am really looking forward to uh, to getting this one out there, man. Thank you, and um, I hope you know in the, in the past, and I hope I ain't talked too much. I told you I was a preacher, so that means you need to shut me down. So, but thank you, and thank you um, to your family for allowing us to have this time to talk tonight. We appreciate that, man. Thank you. Atolas, based out of Charleston, South Carolina, is an eyewear accessory and gear company focused on enhancing your time on the water. Their floating sunglass retainers are the most technically advanced around. Over five years of engineering, testing, and exhaustive feedback from paddlers, anglers, and watermen have resulted in a patented design and a class of its own. They're incredibly light and comfortable, built for durability, sport a sleek, minimal design, float virtually all brands and models of sunglasses, and they're back for life. So if you break them, Atolas will replace them, no questions asked. Whether you're fishing, kayaking, or boating, Atolas will save your shades from the dream. Head on over to A-T-O-L-L-A-S dot C-O to check out their gear and use promo code FAITHINFISH15, that's FAITH, the letter N, FISH, the number one, five, at checkout to save 15% on your order.